to invite our host, Susan Barger, from the FAIC to please go ahead and begin whenever you're ready. Hi, everyone. Nice to see you. Um, I'm, I'm really looking forward to this. We've said for years that connecting to collections and connecting to collections care was uh, also dealt with living animals, but this is the first time we've done anything like that. So I'm going to run through some things. I just want to remind you that uh, since I note that there are many storms and floods going on, if you need assistance during a disaster um, with your collections, you can always call the National Heritage Responders Hotline, and it's a 24-hour line, and there are people that are trained to help you with those kinds of things. Um, if you have questions and you want answers about caring for collections, um, you can always post them on our website. In order to post a question, you need to register, but it doesn't it doesn't cost you anything, and it it takes a few minutes. So please take advantage of that. We're also on Facebook, we're on Twitter, and we also have a listserv that only does announcements. It only goes maybe once or twice a month. And if you want to sign up for that, this is the um, the website right here. And um, then you can always contact me. This is my email address, and I'm happy to um, entertain you or answer your questions or whatever you need. And finally, coming up in September, we're going to have a, a webinar on MAP and CAP, which are two assessment programs for small and mid-sized museums. And then we're going to have one on the ASLH program steps. So be sure to tune in for those. And um, I think that's it. So I'm going to turn this over to Yvonne Nadler and Ashley Zielinski. And I'll let them start. So go ahead, Yvonne. Wonderful. Um, thank you all for joining this opportunity to speak with you today. Like Susan said, my name is Dr. Yvonne Nadler. I am the program manager for the ZAP Fusion Center. And um, I'll get into that a little bit, what that means, a little bit later in our presentation. But you know, to give you an idea of who I am before I turn this over to Ashley to introduce herself, is I'm a, I'm a veterinarian with a master's in public health in epidemiology and biostatistics. Um, my husband and I still continue to own a mixed animal practice in Piatown, Illinois, which I told Susan was the end of the civilized superhighway as we know it. It's a very small community in Illinois. And I am currently contracting with the Association of Zoos and Aquariums to help develop the Zap Fusion Center. So it's important to know that I have a very strong background in agricultural um, medicine, uh, food producing animals, as well as pets. I've always had a passion for uh, zoological collections. And that's sort of what got me into uh, working with the Association of Zoos and Aquariums at the Lincoln Park Zoo in Chicago. So I'll put myself on mute here, and I'll let Ashley introduce myself or herself, and then we'll begin the presentation. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ashley Golinski, and I am the program coordinator for the Zap Fusion Center. And I do work out of the Association of Zoos and Aquariums, uh, which is located in Washington, D.C. If you're not familiar, it's an incredibly body uh, for Zoos and Aquariums. So I'm very happy to be on the Zap Fusion Center project. Uh, I do kind of the day-to-day -day operations, website maintenance, training, things like that. So my contact information is included uh, in that handout, as is Yvonne. But if you have kind of any day-to-day -day questions, you want to get on our listserv where we send updates uh, for different disasters and preparedness resources for uh, facilities with animal collections, please contact me and let me know, and we'd happy, be happy to get you set up with that. And I will give it back to Yvonne for your presentation. Great. Well, thanks, Ashley. So um, before we get started, I think it's important to give you all a little bit of history about how both myself personally as well as the zoological industry has kind of gotten to this point in thinking about preparedness planning for our collection. So um, back in 2006, 
I was hired by Lincoln Park Zoo in Chicago to work on a project known as the Zoo Animal Health Network. And at the time, that was a cooperative agreement between the Association of Zoos and Aquariums and the United States Department of Agriculture Animal Care to work on projects of mutual interest to the um, exhibitor community and to the Department of Agriculture. So one of the biggest concerns at that time was uh, preparing our little bubble for foreign animal diseases. And if you don't know what a foreign animal disease is, it's essentially a, a disease of, uh, there's obviously many different types of these foreign animal diseases, but it's essentially diseases of primarily uh, food producing animals that causes tremendous regulatory response and often results in trade restrictions. So this is very important to the agricultural community, which quite frankly feeds the world, right? We feed the world. So it's a very important for our country to keep these foreign animal diseases out whenever possible. And so I was brought in because while we're not, uh, we, we don't often have agricultural animals as our primary um, missions in zoos, certainly we've got petting zoos and the like that are in some of our institutions, but I was thinking more on a population level. For some of these incredibly rare and exotic animals, um, how to protect them and what we needed to know from the USDA should foreign animal diseases emerge in the United States and how it would impact our business model, essentially. So I, was, I went about the task of finding out as much as I could about foreign animal diseases and how it affects our industry and our collection. And at the time, if you recall, uh, my primary charge was avian influenza. And the reason I started with avian influenza is because back in, at the end of 1999, you'll likely recall that highly pathogenic H5N1 avian influenza emerged in Southeast Asia. And it's not all that important that you understand what the H's and N's mean. It's just a way to name these, this incredible number of viruses that um, affect birds, essentially. But the thing to know is that influenza A viruses, some of them can also affect human beings. And so back in the late 1990s, early 2000s, we were extremely concerned about this nasty H5N1 that was circulating in Southeast Asia, eventually made its way to Africa and Europe. And how would zoos and aquariums and other exhibitors protect themselves from this? The biggest scary thing about this was the Centers for Disease Control um, in Atlanta was also very concerned about this because this is one of those viruses that also has the characteristic of potentially being zoonotic. And what that means is that it's a disease that's shared between animals and man. And I just looked up this morning the current number of this H5N1 influenza that has, that has affected humans. And we know that the World Health Organization uh, tells us that at, at the end of July, there were 859 documented cases of this H5N1 bird flu that affected humans. Now, again, these are only documented cases, so there's likely quite a few more. Of those documented cases, there's a case fatality rate of 52%. So that means that over 52% of the individuals documented to have this disease went on to die. So obviously, that's a very big concern for the public health community and for the animal health community. So this is why avian influenza was such a hot topic at the time. So what we did, we had a three-prong approach to sort of preparing our community for influenza. First of all, we ran a little pilot surveillance project that we had three zoos across the country. And what we did is we set up a project whereby 
certain birds that were um, exposed more than likely to these viruses should they emerge in North America would be collected on a monthly basis and we would take uh, oral swabs and cloacal swabs, which is, you know, the, the um, anal opening for the bird, and look for influenza viruses and submit them through, um, you know, the proper diagnostic channels and just to see if, if we can participate in surveillance that affects both animal and human health. And boy, oh boy, we learned a lot from that effort. Um, just how difficult it can be to look for something you really don't want to find, um, that was quite a challenge. The other thing that we did is we developed a little white paper that we provided back to the United States Department of Agriculture because the, the poultry industry and the zoological industry, certainly at the time, we are not allowed to vaccinate for avian influenza in this country, except in very, very rare circumstances, and it's certainly not for H5N1 influenza. So what we did is we developed a white paper that looked at the vaccination strategies for birds in zoological collections in Europe. They had actually done an entire vaccination program for each of the different European Union countries that allowed their birds to be vaccinated when the threat for avian influenza was high. And um, the wonderful thing about it is the vaccination of new birds did not affect the trade status for the poultry in those countries. And that's a really big deal. Because like I said, the animals that the birds and animals that are in your collection and the animals and birds in zoological institutions were a very small part of the overall animal health pie. So we've got to be very cognizant of what our agricultural um, padres are, are doing in their industry. And so we basically went back and said, you know, if we do have it here, let's at least consider vaccination based on this European situation. And then, of course, the other thing that we did is we wrote an outbreak management guidance document. Because with the surveillance we were conducting, what do you do if you find something bad? You've got to know what to do with it. So we developed this guidance for state animal health officials and for the United States Department of Agriculture to deal with avian influenza should it be detected in a zoological institution. So then what we did is we said, all right, we've got some plans in place. You've got to exercise it. And Ashley will talk a little bit about uh, training and exercises a little bit in her part of the presentation. But, um, you know, we, we developed certain exercises that really sort of tested zoos in terms of what would they do if avian influenza was near your facility and finally affected animals within your institution. And even though a lot of these places had really good plans in place, it improved their planning by running through these exercise scenarios and realizing where they had gaps. And so one of the things that we'll talk about is the training and exercises that need to be done to both evaluate your plans as well as make your plans better. And these exercise scenarios are on our website that you'll be introduced to. So if you guys are ever interested in looking at how we put these exercises together, that's all available on our website. So, like I said, I really worry about disease issues, but one of the things that we discovered when working through avian influenza is that I really don't think it's a, an efficient use of time to think that you have to have a plan for every possible hazard that could be faced by your facility. Um, you know, do you really need an avian influenza plan? Do you need, um, you know, a, a tornado plant? Do you need a, you know, dry well plant? Well, we started thinking about can we provide guidance to think about disaster preparedness for whatever hazard and using, using that really all hazards approach. So back in 2008 was our first attempt at developing some guidance information 
for the zoological community on all hazards preparedness. And at the time, it's really a collection of great resources from many, many different industries because we had never really sat down before to try to collect this specifically for zoos and exotic animal collections or for curated collections of any kind. So this material is still available on our website. Um, it's, it's a good little resource. We know that some of the links are out of date, but a lot of the information there is still very, very valuable. Um, but Ashley is going to introduce you to a more recent uh, project that we worked on that really helps walk you through uh, contingency planning in a really thoughtful way. But certainly one of the things that we recognized as we worked through this is, is this was just me sort of being at Lincoln Park Zoo, being the, the best cheerleader that I could for disaster preparedness. So um, I recognized that um, my, my platform, my, my mission needed a bigger tent to sit under. So that's when we sort of connected with the Association of Zoos and Aquariums, of which uh, you know, uh, Lincoln Park Zoo is certainly a member. But uh, Mr. Steve Olson, who remains our Fusion Center Supervisor, basically said, you know, we need to have this under the AZA umbrella. And it was very helpful to do that because they bring to us, you know, someone like Ashley and a network of subject matter experts and con connections with other members of the exotic animal industry that I could never develop on my own. So that was the concept for the ZAP Fusion Center. And really, ZAP is an acronym that very loosely stands for Zoo and Aquarium All Hazards Preparedness, Response, and Recovery Fusion Center. So you can imagine why we need a catchy name like ZAP. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit of what we're not before I get into who we actually are. We're not an incident management team. We don't have trained responders that come in to assist, um, you know, come, you know, come flying in out of our headquarters in Silver Spring, Maryland, and we don't have a cache of equipment and supplies to use for our members of the community in case of a disaster. But what we are is a very integrated conduit of information between the exotic animal industry, um, game ranches. USDA regulators, nonprofit, non-governmental organizations whose mission it is to actually be the responders for animals and disasters. So we act as that connector to these other groups because what we have are people. We've got subject matter experts in virtually every species, every taxa you can possibly imagine. So when these animals get in trouble during a crisis, we likely know someone in the area that may be able to provide some subject matter expertise to reach out to maybe even respond, um, you know, and essentially connect people with other like-minded individuals that may be able to help in these situations. Um, many of these organizations that we work with you know, their primary mission is dogs and cats. And so when they reach to us for information on exotic animals and the like, we've got facilities and we know people in institutions across the country. And that's what really makes ZAP work. Ashley, myself, and Steve are the worker bees, but ZAP is really a much larger community than just us three. So I, before we get into... Uh, going through the steps of this, I really want to take some time in explaining to you why, if you have animals or not, um, why it's important to invest your time and resources into contingency planning. Well, the biggest reason that I give to my folks is that our community, as well as your unique community, is very, very vulnerable. And this quote is attributed to a buddy of mine, Mr. Terry Lincoln. And he's the director of the Dakota Zoo. Um, and he underwent, his facility underwent a very serious flood back in 2011. And they ended up in evacuating their entire zoo, not once, but twice, during that flooding event. 
And later on in the month, he arrived at the Roosevelt Park Zoo. I'll have some photos to show you of that facility in a moment, where um, Terry was interviewed by the New York Times. And he said this to the reporter. He says, if you're taking up furniture and throwing it up on a truck, anybody can do that. But in a zoo setting, you can't take someone off the street and say, go get the 500-pound lion. It just doesn't work that way. And I'm sure that you likely have animals in your care that have very unique needs in managing them. You have very unique needs for managing your, your, pre your precious inanimate collection. I wouldn't have the slightest idea how to manage valuable, priceless manuscripts. And so this is why you need to take this upon yourself to recognize that your planning is going to be very important because of your unique vulnerabilities. The other reason that's really important to bring to the, to the front about this is sometimes I think our community is a little overconfident because I have been um, I've had the pleasure of meeting a number of emergency managers from across the country, and I've talked to them, these local folks that have the training and they, you know, they know their job very, very well, and I've talked to them and I've said, well, you know, have you worked with your local zoo? Have you worked with your local, you know, special collection? And I've been told, oh, we don't have to worry about the zoo. They've told us that they have their own plan. Well, that to me just makes me want to scream. Because the development of a good plan absolutely has to include your local professional. 90% of the things that happen in your facility, you likely handle without the need for their assistance. But that 10%, that 5% of these low likelihood, high consequence events, where you really need them, you need their help to recover from this. If you don't have them helping you with, with your plans, you're not prepared. Your plan is as good, it's, it's no better than the paper that it's written on. So this is why one of the biggest take-homes I want for each and every one of you to remember is that you've got to work with your locals on developing your plan. So I'm going to just briefly run through here um, some of our examples of, of disasters you know, our community is not immune, and neither is yours. Your best plans are in facilities that have had disasters. So if you're starting from this today going, oh, my God, we've got nothing, or our plan is, is you know, really thin, and we really need to get working on this, don't worry. You have time. Remember that the best plans are in, are in the facilities that have had disasters because they tested their plans, and they've realized it's not thin enough. Reach out to your, your colleagues and help them figure out how can you make your plan better. You guys, these new threats are now reality. Um, you know, 15 years ago, would we have thought that some of these um, highly vulnerable targets, such as, um, you know, buildings, uh, would be flown into by airplanes? We need to recognize that we are really soft targets. And so how do we start to get our heads wrapped around preparing for these things that we never hoped we'd have to worry about? And finally, I always like to bring this up in terms of climate change. We know that the climate on, in the globe is changing. And the projections for a number of our facilities are looking at 50 years down the road where they're going to be suffering extreme difficulty in dealing with flooding along the coast. And I'm sure that your facilities are in the same situation. So we've got to be forward thinking and lean into this and recognize that, you know, the old way of doing things is not going to be adequate for preparing us for new events. We've got to share our lessons learned and best practices. So specifically, why do you want to plan for your animals in disasters? You've got to keep your staff safe. Okay, one of the primary objectives of incident management on any level is human life, health, and safety. Responding to a disaster is very stressful, and you're doing things you don't normally do in a day. You've got to make sure that your staff has adequate direction and can stay safe during a disaster. 
Our animals have very high societal value. Your collections are loved by the members of your community. We want to protect public safety. We don't want our animals getting out in a disaster to threaten the public. We've got to protect our first responders. What if you have venomous animals in your collection? And for some reason, the fire department has to go into this reptile room. Have you worked together with them to make sure that those first responders are going to be safe? We've got to protect public and agricultural health from diseases that our animals may have. We don't want it, we don't want that uh, spilling over into wildlife or the public, for goodness sake. Now, conservation. Conservation is a huge mission statement for many of our facilities. Some of these animals are genetically irreplaceable. If we're planning for them in disasters, we are going to lose a significant amount of that gene pool, and that's not in anybody's interest. And finally, it's good business practice. You are going to be able to reopen and get back to doing the business of educating the public much quicker if you have thought about some of these things ahead of time. And finally, I don't want to ignore uh, a very real reason to plan, and it's public perception. I'm not going to read this out loud, but you can get the drift. This is taken from uh, an internet chat site, and this is also a, a quote in print, uh, following a disaster in a zoo. And your public expects that you have plans in place to protect the animals in your care. You cannot get your message of education, conservation, and whatever else your, your overall mission statement is if the public doesn't think you're protecting the animals and the people in your care. So really, have I convinced you yet that you really need to spend some time thinking about contingency planning for your collection, both inanimate and alive. And there are some interesting resources that Ashley's going to share with you um, a little bit later on in the presentation. But one of the things I'm going to do for you is give you a little brief overview here in the time I have left to talk about some of the disasters that have affected um, animal collections specifically and um, give you some of the lessons that we learned from that. Well, certainly Hurricane Katrina. Uh, was a watershed moment for animals in disasters. Uh, one of the things that came out of Hurricane Katrina was uh, resulted in something called the Pets Act. Um, I'm not going to go into what that means, but essentially what it does is that is it uh, requires accommodation for those individuals being evacuated from natural disasters um, that we have to we have to think about taking care of pets and service animals because Hurricane Katrina showed us that people will not evacuate without their pets. I want to put a, a note, a big asterisk on this, though, is that the Pets Act mentions nothing about animals in collections, about animals in zoos, about agricultural animals. So this is why we, as owners and operators, really need to step up and do a lot of that planning ourselves. Um, the Audubon Zoo. Um, the Audubon Zoo, or I should say Audubon Nature Center, um, is a collection of uh, facilities down in Louisiana, one of them being a zoo, another one is a lovely nature center, that was really affected by Hurricane Katrina. We learned a ton about animal emergency management from them. Um, just a little bit of background, you know a lot of the story about Katrina. But there was six to eight feet of water in the lower ninth ward, and there was 10 foot in the St. Bernard Parish. Uh, luckily, the Audubon Zoo, uh, there, was, there was obviously a lot of rainwater on the ground, but the levels of water in the zoo never, it never rose to that amount, which was obviously very good. Um, the, the scary thing about this, though, is um, it caused $10 million damage to the Audubon Institute grounds um, from Hurricane Katrina, $2.5 million damage to the zoo itself in fences and roofs, um, $7 million in lost revenue. Okay, that's a significant 
significant amount of money in anybody's book. And when you talk to Mr. Larry Regard that was at Audubon at the time, one of the things he tells us is that um, the reason they were able to get back on their feet was really because they had business interruption insurance. So any of you that are involved in you know, senior staff and upper level management, uh, it really behooves you to understand what your insurance coverage is for these sorts of things. Because even though this was a federally declared disaster and they were able to get some FEMA reimbursement, FEMA does not protect everything. It does not pay you back for everything. Um, so you've got to keep that in mind. You've got to know what you can expect back and, and who might be able to come to your aid if you have one of these catastrophic events in your institution. Obviously, here's the, the black bear yard, uh, lots of damaged trees. I believe they lost a thousand trees. Uh, these fences were all damaged. Uh, most all of the animals were in holding, so you know nobody escaped. Uh, you know, ironically, many of the birds that they have down there remain on an exhibit because these are species that are used to uh, storms of this nature in their natural habitat. And I believe they only lost one bird to the storm itself, which is pretty darn good. And uh, that's because they had some warning and they really stepped up and got a lot of these uh, vulnerable animals into safe holding situations. And uh, this is one of the things Larry likes to talk about. They had a very well-developed plan uh, going into Hurricane Katrina. They have what they call their response team. And you can see on the left, uh, they had a number of folks that were ready for two weeks of isolation in a, a reptile house, which is a very sturdily built brick building that was a bunker. And that's essentially where their staff lived until the, you know, the, the, the zoological cavalry arrived from some of our neighboring institutions. But one of the lessons that they learned, look at how they increased the number of folks on their team in 2008. They recognized that they started with five keepers or curators. They've gone up to 15. And the other thing to note is that they not only have one response team, they've got their B team, which is also as staffed as much as this team is because they've recognized right away, if you're working in 90 degree humidity, 95 degree heat, it, it exhausts folks. And another one of the uh, interesting adds to their stormwater team is the chef. Because the last thing these keepers and curators and these folks working these operations want to do is worry about cooking when they come in after a 12 hour shift and they're exhausted. Okay, this is Soros River flooding in 2001. And this is what that friend of mine, Terry Lincoln, went through that we mentioned earlier, uh, that nice quote, talking about the vulnerability of special collections. Um, this is the Roosevelt Park Zoo in Minot. Um, the water came in for them. Um, they had about six to eight feet of water that sat there for days and days and days. Um, they had a brand new $1.8 million visitor center that was being con constructed at the time, and there was $180,000 to that, you know, as of yet, you know, completed building. That was heartbreaking. Um, this is their education building, eight feet of water there. There was literally no building on the property that they could even work out of. The entire place was absolutely inundated. What these folks ended up doing, and fortunately, again, they had some preparation. They knew this water was coming. They were able to evacuate a number of their uh, more dangerous animals, such as bears, to other institutions in the area. They were able to move their farm animals out to uh, neighboring farmers. And this was a temporary, they called New North, that was set up in an abandoned furniture warehouse that was north of the zoo, and they operated out of that for months. They had just a tremendous outpouring of support from a number of institutions that sent um, other folks there to you know, aid them because they were, you know, they were spread out all over the place taking care of these animals. And so uh, you know, it was a real testament to what can be done uh, with a little bit of planning. Fortunately, they 
were able to, you know, the zoo reopened, but it took two years to get that facility back up and fully functioning. Sometimes we don't have warning for these sorts of things. Um, a Superior Zoo in Duluth, Minnesota, this was a, a torrential rain event that the first note that there was anything wrong at the zoo was a photo posted on Twitter. And this is it. One of their animals had floated up and out of its enclosure and was found in the middle of an intersection in Duluth, Minnesota. And so obviously this was extremely distressing. Uh, the zoo itself see here, uh, is, is sort of on the banks uh, in a lovely park fight type setting. And you can see this very large sort of swale area on, on the left-hand side of your screen and a small babbling brook that usually runs through it. And you can see what this freakish 500-year rain did to that uh, small babbling brook. It essentially overwhelmed the entire city. You can see that the farm in the zoo area on the lower left, uh, the water's so deep you've got Coca-Cola machines floating down the river. You can see all the debris piled up against a footbridge that you know, it's usually many, many feet above the ground. Um, very sadly, they did lose a number of animals in their farm in the zoo exhibit, uh, but the entire community suffered. You can see that there were cars that were swallowed up by sinkholes. So this was a total community uh, situation. But fortunately, because these folks had had some plans in place, the training paid off. Um, it may be a little bit difficult to see but um, the, the individual in the red on the tailgate of the white pickup truck is my friend, Dr. Louise B.A., who consults with the zoo and manages their, um, uh, their, their animals. That is Berlin the polar bear, uh, safely tranquilized on one of the walkers in the zoo with the police department, the poor guy standing behind the door of his cruiser because he's scared to death. But he's uh, essentially there in case Berlin was not quite as sedated as we would have liked. But the, their training together paid off. And Berlin was successfully tranquilized and returned to his enclosures after the water receded. And fortunately, no one was hurt. Um, so that was a very good lesson learned. The Gatlinburg fire, very briefly. Earlier this year, um, this is Ripley's Aquarium. And many of you may be set up like this with most all of your animals housed indoors. Uh, aquariums are amazing. If you ever get a chance to visit this place, it's a phenomenal aquarium. Well, this is what it looked like in the middle of a fire. This is all the smoke that surrounded that aquarium. And many of you know that there's very sophisticated life support systems in aquariums. And it's my understanding that the uh, fire was very, very close to the facility. You can even see this clip on YouTube. You know, this is the aquarium here, sort of all decked out in there. There are holiday lights, and there is the fire burning behind it. Fortunately, um, there were very good outcomes from this. They had worked together with their um, emergency managers and fire department. Um, the folks at Gatlinburg at the, at the aquarium, there was a forced evacuation. They were not allowed to keep their team there. And so what they had done is they fueled up the generators as best they could. They prepared things uh, as, as much as they could prepare. And then everybody bugged out and literally had 24 hours of sleeplessness to figure out what was going to happen to the aquarium. They had done some pre-planning. The biologists and the aquarists were among the first individuals allowed back in to the area once it was deemed safe. And fortunately, no animals were lost at the Ripley's Aquarium due to this fire. And that was a, a result of doing some pre-planning, of doing some mitigation around their facility before the fires began. And um, like I said, you can look, at this, look this up on YouTube. Um, it, was, it was quite uh, an event uh, at the time. So the last thing I'm going to talk about here, and before I turn it over to Ashley, are some of the lessons that we've learned that you know, you may likely know or that we definitely want to impart to you is, first of all, those that have plans in place have better outcomes for living collections as well as other curated collections. Integration with your local responders is key to your success. 
please do not develop your plans in isolation. And Ashley will talk to you a little bit about who your partner should be in just a moment. And the other big thing that us animal people have to remember all the time is that human life must come first. And to effectively evacuate your animals or care for your animals in a shelter-in-place situation, you've got to protect the people that you expect to perform those tasks in managing those animals under these trying circumstances. So that's about all I have at the beginning here. I'll stick around through the whole thing to answer questions. But what I'd like to do is put myself on mute and turn the rest of the presentation over to Ashley. Thanks, Yvonne. So now that uh, we've given you some evidence of previous instances that we can face in a zoo and aquarium setting, we're going to get into how you might actually go about developing your plan. Now, before I get started, this is based on six contingency planning modules that we have standing on our website, and the link to those and the accompanying workbook is going to be included in those handouts that you see below. So when we reference links and resources, uh, those will all be included in the workbook, and we're just going to quickly go over kind of the tenets uh, and introduction to contingency planning, how you might identify your planning partners, uh, needs and limitations, and a risk assessment, writing your plan, and finally, training and maintenance of your plan. So again, this is kind of a quick, quick overview, um, but those full modules are available, and we certainly encourage you to take a look at those after we're done here if you'd like to learn more. When you're writing your plan, it's most important to realize that the process is more important than the plan itself. And as we continue on in this presentation, we're going to be using terminology used in the Incident Command System, or ICS. So ICS is a flexible, scalable method for organizing incidents, and it's used for pre-planned events and national disasters. It was originally amended by the Fire Service, and its utility has been demonstrated over and over again. We definitely recommend that you learn more about ICS, and if it works for you, consider using this to write your plans, as it will help you integrate and lock in with your local responders. There are training courses available for free online. Uh, there's a great one on Seamless website that you can take, but we also have a training up on the ZAP website that we have adjusted to be made specifically for the new community, and that's the also the link that we provided. So, a brief introduction of the roles and responsibilities. Uh, again, these roles are designed to expand or contract depending on the size and influence. So these are just the basics. The incident commander of IC is going to be the person in charge of this incident, and they must have the authority to manage the situation. The IC may or may not need assistance of command staff for that second tier that you see, depending on the size and scope of the incident. A public information officer, or PIO, is going to be the person who has the authority to update the public on the incident. The fire and the police departments have designated PAOs who will address the media and their questions during any press conferences. A safety officer, or SO, is directly responsible for the safety of responders. Response can be dangerous, and the incident commander looks to the safety officer to assure them that responders can do their job safely. A liaison officer has the important role um, that if there's a fire in your community, your facility may not be directly impacted, but um, that's who you would work with as a stakeholder in case you have any impact from the fire. And then these general staff positions, operations, planning, logistics, and finance are all designed to reform the tasks needed for response, like devising the best plan to reach the response objective, and acquiring and paying for resources needed to manage that incident. It's highly recommended, again, that you learn more about ICS, and in that workbook is where you'll find some links to resources for that. I guess it's three basic objectives that are at the core of incident management, and these are ingrained in the emergency managers and first responders. The first, and most important, is to preserve human life. The incident commander, or again, the person responsible for the management of the incident, recognizes that the safety of their responders and the public is the prime objective. As an animal person, you might think of your collections first, but people cannot do a good job of responding if they are not safe themselves. So you want to make sure that your plans emphasize safety for your response personnel. The second objective of the ICS incident management system is to stabilize the incident. 
This refers to doing anything that can be done to prevent further damage and make conditions safer for the responders. Think about some of the previously discussed incidents affecting the exotic animal industry. What are some strategies and tactics that you may have used to stabilize these incidents? For example, if a tornado was moving through your facility, what are some steps that would help to stabilize the situation? Who would assess if your animals were secure? Who would determine if live wires were down and dangerous? Who would be trained to turn off natural gas? These are tasks that can be done by your staff, and they can also be done by first responders, but Determining the responsibility and authority for doing these tasks is something that should be included in your plan to allow for incident stabilization. The third and final objective of the ICS emergency management is to preserve property and the environment. And this is what refers to your collection. So if you haven't engaged in pre-planning, your animals may be low on the list of priorities. As owners and caretakers of these animals, it is your duty to make sure that you work with locals so that the needs of our, your animals are included in community planning. Again, and let's reiterate, the safety of your staff, the public, and first responders must come first. Before we get into some of the details about plan development, we want to suggest that you make sure your plan is smart or follow the basic tenets. So whenever possible, you want to keep things simple. Simple things are easier to remember and easier to do during an emergency. You also want to try and keep things measurable. Objectives like our plan supports the evacuation of all guests from grounds within 30 minutes, or we need to stockpile 40 bales of hay to last one week. Those are measurable. And when it comes to resources that you need to respond to an incident, having a measurable count of things is very helpful. Plans should also be achievable. If you write a fantastic plan, but there's no realistic way that you can achieve it, it's not a very good plan. Start with what you know you can do, and then build from there. You also want to make sure it's reasonable or that it makes sense for your facility and your local responders. And finally, your plan should be time sensitive by defining what you will do and recognizing how long it will take to do it. And of course, we all know that things always take longer than we think that they should. So identifying how much, much time it might take to meet your objectives and managing the incident is an important part of preparedness. So moving on, we're going to discuss planning partners. Your facility needs help when it's writing a plan. So you want to use your local responders because they already know your local risks. They also would have an event history for your area. So by tapping into their knowledge, you'll greatly decrease the amount of time required to research the risks that your facility may face. Your local partners may also suggest a format or template that they would like for you to use. We don't want you to be compelled to reinvent the wheel if your community emergency manager has a format existing that they would prefer you utilize. Finally, you should use your local responders in your planning process because they are going to be the ones to show up when you call for assistance. Your responders having a greater awareness of your facility through the planning process will pay out big time if they ever need to respond to an incident at your place. Another very important reason that you've got to get local responders involved is because they should integrate you into their plan. They need to know your resources and capabilities. That way, they're going to be much less likely to forget about your research needs during a response. If you are not at the table when they're planning, then you could end up back in line for resources. And a key concept that everyone really needs to understand is that disasters begin and end locally. Your local responders are going to be the first people on the scene, and even if an incident is extremely large, like a tornado or a flood, they're also going to be the last to demobilize and go home. And they're going to be the ones that know the next step if an incident escalates past their ability to manage it. You also want to think about your county emergency response. They may not be directly on your contingency planning team, but they can provide subject matter expertise or even equipment in the event of a disaster. Public health is going to be an important partner in any zoonotic disease event that impacts your collection, since they have the power to shut you down if a disease would pose risk to your staff or guests. You're going to want to make sure that you work with them on any zoonotic disease planning. Your animal control officer may be able to assist you with capture or relocation of some of your animals during an evacuation. Extension agents may know local farmers who could provide large animal transport equipment, and some counties might even have a county animal response team or CART. Your state 
state partner should also be considered when planning. One state partner that should have direct input on your plans, especially when it comes to infectious disease, is your state animal health official or state veterinarian. You have to remember that they bear the responsibility for the health of all animal species in their state, and that includes yours, as well as agricultural species that may be a big economic driver for your state. State emergency management should also be considered when planning, but it's important to note that state resources are only going to be deployed if your local resources have been exhausted and if the state resources are requested. When identifying federal partners, you'll want to think about what agencies have a regulatory role over your facility, what veterinary services region your facility is located in, and if you're eligible for FEMA assistance in a declared disaster. I know we're going over this really quickly, but there's a lot more detail on all of this, including included in those models that I referenced earlier. Some of these non When it comes to other stakeholders who can help you with your plan to provide resources, you don't want to make sure that you don't overlook your non-governmental organizations. These can be great resources, and you want to check out who is available in your area. And another great resource would be other wildlife facilities, since they might be able to assist you with the contingency process, share any equipment that you might not have, or give some training methods that have been helpful at their facility. Uh, their proximity to you is going to be a real advantage to other students needing help. So what are our take home points? Some of the stakeholders that we talked about, such as emergency managers and your first responders, are going to be heavily involved in helping you write your plan. But others, like the USDA and your state veterinarian, are going to just provide input and review. Integration is key to having a successful plan, and that integration may be critical to get a good place in line to get the things that you need to respond to an incident or a disaster. Integration and timely acquisition of resources may mean a more successful outcome with a quicker return to normal activity and business continuity. So to draft useful plans, besides having the right people to help you, your facility must figure out for what you will need to prepare. So that brings us to introducing the concept of a risk assessment. Why do you need a risk assessment? Knowing the risks ensures a proper preparation for the most significant significant or most likely scenarios, while minimizing resources to the least critical. Making a facility-specific plan means knowing your facility's specific risk factors, and making the plan starts with assessing those risks. Of course, the low probability and minimal consequences of, are going to be of least concern, but the other instances should be evaluated and prioritized through planning. Some examples of how to evaluate the risks are included in Module 3 of the modules that we keep mentioning. And when you're looking to assess your risks, you're going to want to consider internal versus external, or what risks might come from inside your facility versus what might be beyond your control. Internal risks are often going to be based on your animal inventory. Animals can present a risk to people, to wildlife, and to agricultural animals. And they also vary in their own vulnerability to various types of disasters and incidents. Relative vulnerability to adverse conditions or infectious diseases must be considered. Think about what species in your collections are particularly sensitive to smoke. What about water quality or contamination, excessive heat, cold? Why species viability is short without filtration, aeration, oxygenation, and circulation? Some other internal risks that you may face could be from chemicals stored on site or potential equipment malfunctions. External factors are the risks that we're usually going to think of when you consider a risk assessment, and that's things that are going to be out of your control, but within your power to anticipate, diminish the impact of, or mitigate in their severity. This could include severe weather events, fire, tornado, flood, hurricanes, and lesser considered risks like a hazmat leak from a nearby railroad or pipeline, water contamination, or a nuclear or volcanic plant. Now we're going to figure out what it takes to make your response successful and what might be beyond your ability to control, but within your capabilities to diminish. So that means figuring out your needs and limitations. Begin by choosing the top three to four hazards that are high likelihood and high consequences for your institution. 
and identify what you have on hand and what your limitations might be before you begin to write your plan. The process will help with resource identification and it's going to build a list of needs. It doesn't make any sense to write a plan without the resources available to accomplish it. You're going to want to think about the resources that are required versus what you have available. And when you're doing this, remember those SMART goals we talked about earlier. You want to keep it simple or break down your plan by hazard, so you're really breaking down what you might need. Think of individual action items and what you might need to accomplish those. Make it measurable. So if you're trying to secure your building from wind damage, don't just make that your goal, but think about what the exact materials might need to be. Do you have those? Do you have the money to get those? And then you're going to want it to be achievable. Is it within your funds? Is it within your expertise? Reasonable? If it's not, is it something you could get? And time sensitive. Of course, the end date for any of this preparation is going to be when the disaster strikes, but you don't know when that's going to be. So setting a time sensitive goal will make sure that you actually complete it versus leaving it on the shelf for a later date that never comes. If you have animals, you're likely going to want to consider a form writer team or a small group of staff that can stay and perform special functions in the event of a lockdown um, so that they can do animal care. Whatever you want to call them, they're going to have special capabilities, and in your needs assessment, training for them might be more important than actual equipment. Now it's time to write your plan. You've done all your homework, identified your partners, done your risk assessment, identified your needs and limitations, and it's going to be time to write your plan. You assemble all your documents, maps, floor plans, and mutual aid agreements that you might have with other institutions. And now you're going to have to determine the plan components of your individual plan. History has taught us that most of these are critical to the wildlife facilities, but you're going to want to work with your planning partners to determine exactly what is needed for you. Communication, you have to consider for both into and out of the facility. Administration, it's all about people and documentation. How will you take care of your staff that's responding or can't get to work? Who will document what is going on in the facility as the response and recovery continues? Data preservation, what data will be preserved? Where, when, how often, and who is responsible for doing so? Where do you have your data backed up? For a shelter in place or lockdown, under what circumstances will this be started? How will sheltering be accomplished? How can it be scaled up or expanded if the event is more serious? Evacuation. Under what circumstances will you need to evacuate people or animals, and how are you going to accomplish this? In lieu of a mandatory evacuation or EMS order, what's going to be the trigger point for animals or people? What's your partial evacuation criteria? An infrastructure assessment. Pre- and post-event facility assessments are going to be critical to many aspects of your plan. In fact, infrastructure assessment and documentation in advance may greatly assist with insurance indemnity or FEMA assistance. Safety and security. This describes what protocols are in place for both pre- and post-events to ensure safety of the people, animals, and structure. Every facility is going to have distinctive considerations, so your plan should include any other unique considerations as identified in your risk assessment and needs and limitations. Specific concerns, characteristics to your facility, such as overhead tram response, rides, on-ground housing, and other considerations are things that only you can identify and should be included in your plan. Animal-specific plan elements of your plan are your distinct challenges in the wildlife facility. So this is going to include animal escape response, multiple animal escape protocols, escaped animals you can't find, and numerous other special considerations that only you can really address. What's a clear plan for the use of lethal force for human protection from animals, and how is it controlled or executed? If you need to shelter your animals in place, how, where, and for how long may they be sheltered? Animal evacuation, what are going to be the components of a partial or complete collection removal? What are the trigger points for animals to be moved? 
Infectious disease is another very specialized consideration which may require plans, inspection, and veterinary expertise. And that's going to be where you really want to get your state animal health official and USDA input for any agricultural disease that could have other economic uh, consequences in your state. So before we move into training and maintenance, we want to look at this cycle of disaster preparation. Once your plan's written, you have to train the people who are expected to respond. You want to make sure that you realize that not everyone at your facility needs to be trained on every element of your plan. But you need to make sure you train your staff to whatever their individual role and responsibility is going to be so that they're really able to follow that plan. For example, if you have an animal escape and the education intern is supposed to direct people to a secure area, make sure that their training includes how you want them to perform that task and then decide how you're going to exercise that training. Where's the shelter for death? How do they get information about the escape? What's the status of the incident as it unfolds? And how do they get the all clear once the incident is under control? You don't need to go into any drug doses, doses or response strategies for the recapture team with that education intern, since that's not going to be what they're responsible for. Only after you've achieved plan approval and properly trained your response or Founders can you implement your plan. Now the cycle is going to continue. Because if an incident happens and the plan is implemented during response, an evaluation should be performed that discusses the strengths and, more importantly, the weaknesses of both your plan and your response. This is going to allow you to identify new risks that you didn't recognize when you were first planning. Take your lessons learned and generate new needs, and then you can modify your plan to better address the hazard, hazard next time it might happen. Don't ever think about planning as a one-and-done situation. And later we're going to discuss some recommendations for keeping your plan as updated as possible. FEMA has developed this graphic, which shows the different types of training exercises, from discussion-based to action-oriented. We're going to get into some of the details in a minute, but note that as you increase capability as responders, the more complicated your exercises can be. You don't want to dive into a full-scale exercise without doing some of the less complicated training and exercises first, because remember, you need to walk before you run. Again, you only need to train personnel on what you expect them to do in a response. And whenever possible, you want to try and make your training engaging and your exercise realistic and challenging and fun. An actual incident will certainly be challenging. So talk to your local partners, your planning team members, and see how you can train an exercise together. Your facility might be a great venue to host drills and exercises. You'll find that your partners probably enjoy and excuse to do something out of the ordinary, like coming to your facility for training. Maintaining your plan is another critical component of the planning cycle. You want to make sure that you're pulling out your plan at least annually and definitely as new risks or needs are identified. After every actual incident or every exercise, you're going to review your plan and decide whether or not anything needs updating. Plans that sit on the shelf and are never reviewed and updated as new hazards are identified will not be as valuable. So if you stuck with us, you've made it, but now is when the real work will begin. Again, this is a crash, quick crash course in contingency planning, so we highly recommend that you take the course in full as shown on our website. This quick uh, introduction which is pared down from six modules that are each at least a half hour long. But for now, your first steps are going to be to develop a relationship with your partners in preparedness, do your thorough risk assessment, look at your needs and limitations, and write your plan. Consider how you're going to train people to execute the plan and how to maintain it. And don't forget that you're going to need the help of folks that you might not deal with every day. Make sure that you develop a relationship with your state veterinarian, and don't forget your emergency management professionals in your area. They're going to be key partners in preparedness and should help you develop your plans right from the start. And if you have any questions moving forward, uh, you can certainly email Ivana or myself. And then our supervisor and our USDA contact are also included on here if you have any questions for them. And now I'll turn it over to Susan for any questions. OK. Um, I'm going to put up the evaluation link here. And evaluations are really important for us, so please uh, let us know. Uh, please, you know, respond to this. And then we'll see if there are any questions. Um, I, I have to say that 
um, I, in my experience, people usually don't get an emergency plan until after they've had an emergency. And um, so this is really valuable, whether you have animals or not, uh, to figure out what you're going to do. Um, exactly before, right, and, Susan. You're exactly right. Yeah, and to get, you know, I, I know so many museums that are afraid to have the fire department come in, for instance, and I tell them, if the fire department doesn't know what's important in your collection, how are they going to help you out? Exactly um, right. You, you know, and, and like Ashley talked about, how we want you to take the top three to four things that are most likely to happen and write plans that address the needs of, you know, certain species of animals or um, certain collections that you may have. You've got to start slow um, because otherwise it's just too easy to look at the enormity of it and go, oh, my God, this is, this is way beyond my ability to do anything about it. But if you start concentrating on those things that are most cherished by the institution, and start walking through that, you're going to be amazed at how other things and other species will be managed and you know, will be included in some of the things you need to worry about. Um, certainly, okay, say for instance, you start talking about, um, okay, I've got birds and we have snowstorms and we worry about electricity going out. So you begin down that path of, you know, we're, you know, we're above a bird emporium, so obviously birds are very key to our business model. So let's talk about, you know, the snow load and losing electricity. Well, guess what? You're going to have a pretty sound electricity outage plan when you're done planning for that. It can be used for any hazard. You know, what do you do? Um, maybe it's not snow that causes this problem. Maybe it's a transformer fire away from your facility that's going to keep electricity out for a week. Well, you still have gone through that process of planning for an electrical outage for your high likelihood snowstorm that's also going to help you when you've got a transformer that blows. Um, so we, it, it's a difficult concept in a way to, to begin to get your head wrapped around. Well, how do all these little pieces fit together? But I'm telling you, your Folks that do this for a living in your area are why it's so important to to leverage their expertise. And like like Ashley said, invite them to your facility. Bring them over for lunch. Give them a cruise of your facility. Some of our um, members have, have talked about how they've had um, they've invited an emergency manager and his family to come to the zoo for the day. And what they've done is that, you know, there'll be some, the, the planning team will sit down with the emergency manager, they'll have lunch, they'll have a curator take the kids and the wife for a behind the scenes look at the facility, and then that relationship um, is, what, is what brings the importance of what you do every day to the attention of these folks that can help you. That's how you get connected. And so I would highly encourage you to consider doing something like that. Um, I, I'm uh, trying to get in touch with and playing phone tag. Um, the, I believe the state police in Missouri just did uh, a full-scale exercise at the Kansas City Zoo for a search and rescue, you know, a search and rescue training opportunity. I mean, that's pretty darn cool. Um, that's a huge campus. And to have those subject matter experts on the ground uh, looking at a search and rescue situation, and, you know, they're highly, you know, they talk very highly about, well, we should be doing this in any place there's these animal, you know, these animal issues where, where you have these um, exhibits and these facilities. And once they begin to see your unique challenges and how you can play along with this to your benefit as well, it's a really good stepping stone for further collaboration. Yeah, yeah. Um, if I, I, there must be some questions out there, so please post them in the questions comments box. Um, and um, 
I, I have to say, I, I never really thought about what to do with animals, but I know from talking with Yvonne that sometimes people just let their animals out, which is horrible. Um, yeah, there was a, there was an incident in Pennsylvania several years ago where the plan was to just open up the the gate and let the bison out, and you know the the bison uh, at the end were all right, but um, anybody that's worked with bison will tell you it's not like wrangling cows. It's a very very dangerous animal, and um, you know that that. Public safety officer, your police, if, you know, if they came upon a situation where they thought that the public was in danger, that bison would be in trouble. And considering police probably don't know the, the best place to try to take down a buffalo with firearms, even if they're more, most powerful, um, it did not end up nicely for the buffalo. So, you know, it's it's our responsibility, to, as much in our power, to try to prevent those things from happening in the first place. Um, and, there's you a know, and here. Uh, oh, go ahead. Oh no, I was going to say if they're if they're typing a, a question, you know, and and if you if you you know, I I have no idea what your different facilities are like, but you know, even with smaller animals, you know, smaller collections, you often have a great deal more advantage. And that, you know, working with um, your anti-cruelty society, working with some of your small animal responders, there's probably resources in your area, such as, you know, very kennel, crates, et cetera, where evacuation is a heck of a lot easier for you guys than it is for evacuating a rhino. Um, you know, the equipment right. needed to do that are few and far between. But those of you with smaller animals that are less dangerous, um, you've got, you know, you you can make some good connections there um, that can bring resources to you if needed. And I do see a question that says, there are ADA accreditation standards in relation to emergency procedures. Absolutely. Absolutely they are. They are. Um, not every um, licensed exhibitor, of which ADA is like 237 facilities out of, over 2,200 licensed exhibitors. Um, currently, there is no requirement for written contingency plans in the Animal Welfare Act, which is what allows you to be an exhibitor. Um, but we also know, in talking with some of the folks within AZA, um, that their plans could be more robust because they're looking at um, Maybe some of these, you know, these high likelihood things. They've got great plans for escaped animals and the like, but some facilities have recognized through working through this process that maybe their plans for their storm rider teams or for the shelter in place for people in the event of storms are not quite as robust as they should be. So we're trying to encourage everyone to, um, you know, really work with their locals and determine if their plans are not just adequate for accreditation, but are really taking into account these low likelihood, um, high consequence events that could happen. Yeah, um, Mike had a question. What did they do at the New York City zoos when the hurricane went through a couple of years ago? I imagine that's Hurricane Sandy. Yeah, I've got some anecdotal information from that. Um, you know, certainly I'm I'm not an expert. Uh, is there anyone on from that area that can speak directly to that? Um, if not, what I what I can tell you is that um, that was kind of an interesting situation because there's five zoos, I believe it's five zoos that make up uh, WCS, the uh, um, uh, Wildlife Conservation Society, and that's like Staten Island Zoo, Bronx Zoo. You know, there's there's a number of them, and the the aquarium. Was, was hit pretty hard. Um, so in a way, they had, you know, they had a tremendous amount to clean up. Um, one of the things we did learn from that is that um, there was a lot of water inundation, especially on the facility that was right along the coastline. And the only part of that facility that didn't lose power was the new animal hospital because their generator had been put on the roof 
And, you know, so many of our facilities have these big life safety equipment things in basements because they're just darn ugly and you don't want them sitting out. Um, so they, they were able to hunker down uh, a lot of these vulnerable animals in that animal hospital area that kept, you know, that kept the lights on, that kept the people safe. And then a number of the WCS employees from the facilities less affected by Superstorm Sandy were able to come to the aid of the facility that was really, you know, in trouble. And, and the other thing that's kind of interesting about that situation is that the facility that was the most severely affected obviously had done a lot of planning, pre-planning, and it's one of the largest economic engines in that particular area of the, the New York metro area. So everyone was very committed to getting that place back up and open as soon as possible. So they were able to you know, raise some funds. They did some fundraising. They had uh, support from, like I said, their other WCS institutions that really helped them get up and get going uh, quicker than, was the, than you know, probably would have happened almost anywhere else. And another well, interesting thing about uh, the aquarium and the response that kind of came out that you might want to consider in your planning is if you are an institution that's really beloved, uh, a lot of people locally want to help you out, and they might just kind of show up after you face disaster. And of course, with lots of animals there, with potentially down wires, there's a lot of hazards that might be faced. So you want to think about what you might do if volunteers show up on your doorstep wanting to help you out. Um, because they might be angry if they're turned away. So trying to, to think about how you might mitigate that. <laughs> yeah, it's you know, really it's a good, good idea to, to have, a, you know, consider having someone that's going to be in charge of volunteer management. Um, because, you know, I know you, you've probably all seen, the, you know, people want to turn out and do something. And, uh, you know, in Katrina, there were parking lots full of just junk that people dumped. Um, and it just sat there getting wet and rotting because, you know, obviously that was, that was a huge incident. But, you know, people want to help. And, you know, sandbags, we, the, the zoos up in Minnesota employed some of their more able-bodied volunteers to assist with sandbagging. And that's very common in, in a number of communities inundated by floods. Um, you may also have assigned people, um, you know, to, to monitor social media. So you can, you know, if, if there's rumors being spread about things, um, there was a rumor in one of the uh, floods up in Minnesota that, or, uh, I think it was um, the Canadian flood from the same incident. It was that incredibly wet 2011 where virtually every zoo from Canada all the way down to the Mississippi River was flooded at some point in time. Calgary Zoo, there was a huge rumor going around that all the uh, large cats had been relocated to the county jail. Because that was the only place that, yeah, that could keep them. Well, that was complete fabrication. But, um, you know, you've got to make sure that you are getting your information out in an accurate way. So maybe you have, maybe you get some of your more trusted volunteers just to monitor social media. You know, you may not want to have them engage with the public directly, but it might be nice to know what is being said about you, um, you know, in this in this time of these things going viral, um, that then your public information officer can address um, on behalf of the entire institution that has the same message going out from, you know, the, the management, um, incident management team that might be managing the situation, you know, on a community level. So it's, it's always really important seen. to keep an eye on that stuff. Yeah. Right, actually, and we sorry. have seen some, I, I forget the exact example that had told me this, but we definitely have seen some of our zoos and aquariums that, you know, have working relationships that if something's kind of going on, they'll help each other out with these small staff and have a sister institution kind of looking at what's going on on social media and kind of putting the public information officer at the institution facing the disaster, make them aware of things that they might be seeing if it's too much for one person to monitor on their own. Okay. I think that since we have no more questions, I, I want to say that um, Yvonne and Ashley have made all this material available to us 
for free. Um, I mean, it's available on their website, but now we have a connection to it. So please take advantage of that. And um, as soon as, if you look on our website, as soon as you see that the advertisement for this webinar is no longer there, you can look in the archives and uh, for 2017, and you'll be able to click on the link, and there'll be the recording, the slides, and um, the handout will be there, and anything else that they send me. So um, be sure to take advantage of that and tell your people that you know who may not have been able to catch this webinar that that's happening. And we hope that we'll see many of you in September for the two webinars then. And keep looking at the uh, website because we'll have more things happening. We're going to have a course on exhibits that will have a small price, uh, but that will be uh, happening in October. So, you know, stay tuned. And, and we're really glad to have um, people that we've never seen before joining us. Uh, we're here. We offer webinars uh, a little over once a month, and they're free. And it, we are here to help people in smaller institutions take better care of their collections. So thank you all. Thank you, Yvonne. Thank you, Ashley. Thank you, Mike. And um, I think that's it for today. So um, enjoy the summer, and um, we'll see you in September. Okay. Bye-bye. Wonderful. Thank you. Bye-bye.